Thank you all so much for joining us for the GSD's fifth Design Impact Global Summit. As we launch forward today, I am thrilled to report that our event has united over 2,000 people from over 115 countries across the globe. Founded by the Harvard GSD's Alumni Council at the onset, uh, onset of the coronavirus pandemic, Design Impact brings together an outstanding roster of leaders from around the world to share their work and vision at the intersection of health, climate change, and equity. Our singular goal at this moment of historic inflection is to connect our global community of practice, establishing an infrastructure of innovation based on community, inspiration, and shared learning. Across disciplines, generations, and geographies, we are each other's teachers. Each of us, regardless of our age, discipline, geography, or area of practice, is a critical part of our design innovation ecosystem. Taken together, we form a global justice league of leaders and change makers at the ready to take on the challenges presented by a world in crisis, creating design solutions that bend the light and alter the course of history to bring forward a more resilient, healthier, and more equitable world. This event has been a labor of love. Creating a global design innovation community truly takes a global village. Before we dive in, I want to thank all my colleagues on the Harvard Alumni Council and each and every member of our session teams, our speakers from around the world, our event partners and the amazing team at EVIA, and finally the faculty and staff of the Harvard Graduate School of Design for their unflagging support and commitment to our shared work. And finally, thank you, this remarkable global audience. This event is for you. And now it is my privilege to introduce you to the remarkable Sarah Whiting, Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Sarah has been Dean and jo Joseph Louis Cert Professor of Architecture at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design since 2019. She is also a design principal and co-founder of WW Architecture based in Cambridge. Whiting's research and writing is broadly interdisciplinary with the built environment at its core. An expert in architectural theory and urbanism, Sarah has particular interests in modern and contemporary architecture's relationship with politics, economics, and society, and how the built environment shapes the nature of public life. We are so honored to have you with us today and so grateful for your unflagging support. Let's give the warmest design impact welcome to Dean Sarah Whiting. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning. Uh, it is very, very exciting to be kicking off this event, uh, which <laughs> follow the sun. It makes me think of those surf movies of the surfer dudes who go around the world following the waves. Um, but it's actually, I think, a really apt way of addressing our global uh, crises and our global possibilities today, because really we need to be thinking about the world as one. Uh, I think during the pandemic, we've, and, and this virtual convening is an example of this, we've seen how we're able actually to come together and bring the world together through this medium, which is exciting. There is one thing that has actually still stymied us, and that is the global time clock. So I particularly appreciate Anna and our, our uh, keynote speaker this morning, who are joining us from an ungodly early hour on the West Coast. Um, but this is something that we found is that uh, time is less bending than Zoom. And I think that the fact that this event extends over roughly 32 hours is a way of addressing that. So it's a way that the Design Impact Series has understood how to embrace um, the different time zones of the world, which I really appreciate. This series is um, something that I really do support because I think it's a chance for our alumni to really catalyze their intelligence, their reach and their expertise in a way that really shows how they are impacting the world. Design impact is the perfect name for it. This isn't about the GSD. Um, it's not a song and dance about the school, 
but I think it reveals how the school has this reach and leads, creates people who really do extend into very different areas. And so we'll hear from policy, we'll hear from design, we'll hear from different forms of practice that address different parts of the world. And I think that the, uh, for me, the, the intersection of climate change, health and equity is particularly essential right now, particularly urgent. In my all school address just what, two weeks ago, I said to, I explained to the students, faculty and staff that we have many ways of responding directly in the school to all that's going on in the world through what we do, through our huge range of courses, which take on issues of equity, health, climate, infrastructure, reuse, and migration. Our courses focus on the specificity of where design intersects these issues. And I think that that's part of the design impact series is understanding that we reach into different areas, but that we do so through design or where design does that, I think is particularly interesting for us to see. So I wanna thank the Alumni Council for their incredible work to make this event happen. I wanna thank our huge audience for being here. I'm very excited. I'm very excited to listen, to engage and to participate while following alongside um, you, all of you. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce a, a friend, um, colleague, and uh, someone whose work I truly, truly admire. Walter Hood served as the Harvard GSD's Loeb Fellowship Senior Loeb Scholar this past February, virtually alas, although generously, I have to say. So the Senior Loeb is a week in residency at the GSD during which the scholar presents a public lecture, does workshops, has other engagements, and Walter really went beyond the, the PAL. I, I have to say that if you can watch the recording of his um, different talks that he did, um, he extended um, again, very generously um, and thinking always of what it was like to be a student in trying to figure out how to engage the world. Walter is the David K. Wu Chair and Professor of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning at the University of California, Berkeley. He's also Creative Director and Founder of the Oakland-based Hood Design Studio, which he established in 1992. Through engagement with community members, Walter Hood teases out the natural and social histories, as well as current residents' shared patterns and practice of use and aspirations for a place. I, I think he has a, a remarkable way of working with the community in place uh, for creating an even better place. Um, most recently, his landscape design for the International African American Museum drew inspiration from the cultural significance of the museum's story and the local landscape of the Calor Carolina Low Country, taking cues as the description of the project notes from the tradition of hush harbors which were landscapes where enslaved Africans would gather often in secret outside the view of slave owners to freely assemble, share stories and keep traditions from their homeland alive. And I think it's very interesting to think of how that's still actually a relevant and necessary kind of place for all of us. Who had recently co-edited Black Landscapes Matter um, published by University of Virginia Press. So if you don't have your copy, buy one now. Walter, do I get a, a free drink now? Uh, alongside Grace Mitchell Tata, um, his senior Loeb Scholar appointment followed a series of recent honors. He was a recipient of the 2017 Academy of Arts and Letters Architecture Award, the 2019 Knight Foundation Public Spaces Fellowship, and the 2019 MacArthur Fellowship. Walter, it's wonderful to have you here and thank you for doing this particularly so early in the morning. Good morning, Sarah. And Anna, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Sarah, as usual, you know, it's great to see you and great to have this conversation. And Anna, I'm so proud of you. Um, you know, knowing you as a student and now seeing you blooming out in the world, it's just really fantastic. And lastly, hello world. I mean, this is really fantastic to be talking to the world at 530 in the morning um, and really thinking about what I have to say about design futures and particularly as we think about health equity and climate change. You know, this is an incredible time for us in the world. And I thought a lot about what should I talk about this morning? And I really wanna talk about planting trees. Uh, over the last 18 months, um, you know, being home for the first time, 
the world slowed down. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't wanna go back. Uh, you know, it's kind of frightening thinking about the world before the pandemic. I mean, I was traveling upwards to 150,000 miles, you know, around the world. I didn't even know where I lived. I was living in a place where I didn't know my neighbors. And all of a sudden the world slowed down. And I planted 12 trees over the last 18 months and I had to water them. I, I was afraid that they were gonna die. <laughs> you know, so there was this kind of caring that any parent would have. And I think in a way, the pandemic has helped me actually think about the world as my family, right? And that I don't want to exclude my family anymore. I want them to be part of me. So in the Berkeley tradition, I want you all to close your eyes. <laughs> And I want you to kind of think about where we've been. I want you to remember when you didn't hear an airplane flying through the air, what was that like? I live in Oakland and planes fly over. And for days, I never heard an airplane and I could hear birds. I could hear people talking outside my window. Remember there was no traffic. I remember going across the bridge to a site and there was no one on the bridge at nine in the morning. It was pretty awesome because I saw the sky. I actually saw the city. Remember when you just saw animals, I saw raccoons. <laughs> Things that, you know, I never saw before were crossing roads, deer. You know, things literally, when we slow down, the world actually comes closer to us. Remember how we found out where we lived? Actually, every day for 12 months, this one woman walked around my block every day at 12 noon. And one day I called out, who are you? <laughs> and we met. But this happened because we slowed down. Remember how we marched? We marched. And for a lot of people in my generation, even younger, we never marched so much. I never cried so much. I was never so vulnerable for a year. And all of these things forced me to say, I want to keep remembering. Sarah mentioned how we worked. We had to change how we worked. And all of a sudden I figured out I didn't need to be on the airplane. I could reach out to someone and they would be right there for me because we have the technology to do that. I don't want to go back. <laughs> I keep saying that we have the technology to move forward. Everyone wants to say, this is a new normal. It's not normal, it's abnormal. It's not a new normal. We keep paraphrasing and wanting to go back to something that I think we never understood. Remember how we learned. I've never talked to more students in the last 18 months than I think I have in the last 20 years. Students would just reach out and say, can I talk to you? And through the technology, I can give them 15 minutes. They don't have to come to my office in California but all of a sudden the world is open. We could learn a different way. Remember how we played? God, how we played. You know, I have a dance company next to me and they couldn't go inside, so they closed the street. And all of a sudden there were kids out in the street we played. We're going for a bike ride at lunch, <laughs> right? Just doing something really different. We have to remember this. Also, a lot of you learned a musical instrument over the last year, right? I took up the piano. <laughs> I can't play, but I had that moment to do it. Now open your eyes. This is who we are. This is where we can go. We don't have to go back, but this is our accomplishment over the last year. I want to like think that we can harness all of these places, all of these things that we've somehow had to default in, how do we harness that as environmental designers to move forward? And I wanna put this term out, just as an idea of witness. And in the backdrop, there's an installation that my firm just did in for the Chicago Biennale. And we were interested in this idea of, well, I was interested in the idea of the witness trees. I've been somehow tied to this idea of these historic landscapes where these trees sit as sentinels to our history. And I was first introduced to the witness trees in Washington, D.C. on the mall. You can't remove trees because they remember, right, the politic of the past. 
And so if we think of ourselves as these witness trees, oak trees, whatever kind of trees, but we witnessed something the last 18 months. And how do we bear witness to that? And what we think about in the spiritual sense of bearing witness is we tell the truth. And we're constantly telling the truth to one another and bearing these witnesses. And I think as designers, bearing witness, we can begin to give truth to the world. And in these days where truth is actually something that is critiqued, right? Whether we're talking about climate change, whether we're talking about health, whether we're talking about equity, you know, there is a truth out there. And we need to be the people to actually keep reminding folks to one, remember, but also to tell the truth, to be prophetic. And I think as designers, we can harness this. We can be those people to bear witness. Because one, we need empathy. We need to kind of think about that we care for people. In times of crisis, America is an amazing place. When there's something cataclysmic, we, we, we leap. But then when things are normal, we tend to shy. And if we could kind of somehow figure out that empathetic urge that can be there daily, that could be amazing. And now, if we remember, we can actually continue, right? This collective need for community, we forget that we need each other, that we're intricately tied together globally, not just nationally, but globally we're tied together. And we're seeing extreme things happen in Europe, that's happening in Louisiana. I mean, these parallels that we need each other. We've had these conversations on the West Coast. We have earthquakes, but our partners to the East, they have earthquakes. And during those times, we communicate, but during the times when we don't have anything, we don't communicate. And so if somehow we can have this kind of connective tissue that suggests that we are global communities. And I think design begins to do this. Health. I was somewhat perturbed by our response to health in that the first, how can I say, need for food came from our fast food industries. And I don't know if anyone thought of this, but it was like McDonald's. I mean, fast food industries were giving food to people, but we were not talking about the kinds of food that we need, right? It's not that we don't have the ability to do it, but all of a sudden we forgot that we're an agrarian society, that there are, we know what good food is, but we're afraid to kind of somewhat diminish how other people might choose to see food. But health is something that's really, really important, particularly as environmental designers, because as environmental designers, we create the urban environment or the rural environment, and we can give people that space they need. Again, I've never seen people walk as much. I've never seen people eat as much as well <laughs> during the last 18 months. But, but again, collectively having ways to begin to do that. Climate, you know, we talk about the extreme need to somehow control climate, but we don't think of ourselves as being in a climate. I'm in the West Coast here and climate is different than the East Coast. But we have to, as designers, design for those places so that people can understand the places in which they live. So maybe then they will make different decisions about how they live in those places. You know, I always think back to going to Louisiana after Katrina and noticing that a lot of the houses in the floodplain were built on slabs. And someone told me the reason why they did that was because we invented the air conditioning. So this idea of like being in a hot, sultry place and not being hot and sultry suggests then that you don't have to think about the hot and sultry until it comes on your doorstep, right? But again, I think the last year has taught us when we're in a place, we can actually see entropy accumulating around us and that we're part of this continuation. We're just speeding it up. And again, by slowing it down, I think it gives us that moment where we can look more objectively and say, this is how we should be living in these places. Difference. I speak a lot about this idea of difference. And in, in America, I think we're still this great experiment of how do you live in a heterogeneous society and actually respect one another who might have different views, who might look different, who might talk different, how do we get past that? 
And again, accepting others. I think we've done a great job this past year of like being able to like look at one another and say, you have something to offer me and I can learn from you. And it wasn't just a moment. So how do we make it not just a moment? How do we think past diversity? How do we like want to accept the double negative, right? I want contrast in my life. That's sustainable. That's going to force me to actually become something that I never knew I could become. Memory, we have to remember. Why, why are we so quick to forget? <laughs> you know, maybe memory is one of these things that forces us to have a conversation with ourselves and our ancestors. But again, memory also can be this place in which we can embed things for the next generation to not forget. It's, it's our gift in a way. It's that accumulation, it's that palimpsest. And I want future generations to remember where we've been so that they don't have to go through that again. And again, when I think about memory in environmental design, do we forget the 20th century existed? You know, we have a housing problem now. I mean, I remember in architectural history, housing was a big thing in the 20th century. Architects wanted to do housing. Landscape architects wanted to make landscapes. We need that focus again. And again, maybe this downtime can give us that ability to remember. And Sarah kind of mentioned this to a certain degree, but this idea of agency kind of has happened to us in the last 20 years, that architects became uh, entrepreneurs. They became these other things other than architects. They became salesmen. They became branders. Landscape architects became... Um, environmental, I don't know, sellers of something, but we forgot our medium. <laughs> I plant trees. <laughs> I have to figure out how to plant trees. I can talk about poverty. I can talk about these other things, but at the end of the day, I'm planting a tree. I'm putting a garbage can somewhere. I'm doing some paving, but I got to figure out how to do that. Architects are making shelter for people. We're creating habitation. This is our medium. And I think we've forgotten our medium to a certain degree. We wanna do other things other than what it is we know. Specialization is not bad, actually. The expert is not bad with good intentions, with memory, the collective, all of these things together will allow us to kind of move forward. I was talking to my students yesterday about the medium and how we should get excited about putting the tree in a hole, <laughs> but doing it in a way that someone benefits by that, right? And again, I go back to my 12 trees. They're on my sidewalk, on my north side and my south side. And I can look out of the window and I can see someone walking their kid and they're stopping at a tree and taking the leaf and talking to the kid with the, the tree. This is what we do. We make environments and that can be just as powerful. In closing, <laughs> I know I've talked a lot and probably rambled a lot, but in closing, I have one thing I just wanna say to the world, all of our environmental designers out there. I know it's really hard to be courageous in what we do, to say things that maybe people might criticize us for doing, but we do need the courage to kind of move forward, to make change. We need the courage to say, I plant trees, I make a building. That's courageous and that should be enough. And somehow it doesn't seem that in this world that that's enough. But I wanna tell you this morning, that's enough guys. That's enough for us to be able to think about where people live, where people play, where people are unencumbered by climate because we thought about ways in which we can extend how people live in places. This is our future to a certain degree. And I wanna be part of that courageous front of returning back to the simplicity of our discipline, of being able to provide something to the world, to provide shelter, to provide clean water, to provide safe places for people to be, to tell the truth about what's below the ground, to tell the truth about what's in the air. We can do this, we know what this is. We don't need to do more mapping, we don't need to do more advocacy. We have lived through all of this and we've witnessed all of this. 
And so in the next couple of days, tomorrow you're gonna to hear from one of my mentors, Everett Fly, who is one of the greatest inspirations to my memory work. But hopefully with Anna and the GSD and Sarah, that this will be a great couple of days in which we discuss some of these things that I've kind of outlined. And hopefully over the couple of days, we'll all remember where we've been and we want to extend that. We don't wanna close the door. We don't wanna go back to a new normal, but we actually want to become. We wanna become who we can be collectively and the global front. And we wanna do it together. And we want to have that courage to go forward but also the courage to bring those around us who don't have the ability to be with us. So Sarah, Anna, I don't think I fulfilled my complete 20 minutes, but I'm pretty close, right? <laughs> and I look forward to great things to come from you guys globally, but also from my friends on the East Coast. Thank you so much. Thank you, Walter. Thank you so, so much. This was remarkable. Um, thank you so much for inviting us to witness, to imagine a new, more centered, more connected world. Thank you for centering truth, courage, empathy, and vulnerability. Thank you for encouraging us to bring our warmest selves to our work, our family, and our community. And thank you for letting us be enough. And from this simple courage, connect and engage anew. We are beyond grateful to you for the inspiration of your vision and for making time to be with, with us here today. It has been an honor. And as a former student of yours, thank you so much for being my giving tree. I learned so much from you. And I continue to learn from the brilliant example of your work, your life, and your community.